Well, uh, labor has been normalized again under Keir Starmer. Uh, the establishment is breathing a major sigh of relief because under Keir Starmer, labor is not a threat to its hegemony, to the hegemony of the, um, the triangle of authority, which is on the one hand, the city of London, secondly, uh, the media, and uh, thirdly, uh, a, a part of the corporate world which um, simply relies on the kindness of uh, the Bank of England and the state to survive. Yanis, what an honor. Hello. Hi, Owen. It's, um, it's an honor on this side of the pond as well. A huge Good honor to always, always be in your company. You're in Athens right now. That's right, isn't it? No, 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 I'm um, on top of a hill on a small island, uh, an hour's ferry ride from Athens. This is where I live. I live on an island. Of course you live on an island. I bet the, I mean, obviously the most British thing in the world to do is just fall back on the crutch of talking about weather. But I would presume you have slightly more idyllic conditions than those we're currently enduring here. Indeed, and they are also enjoyed by, you know, expats from the UK. Um, so my next door neighbours are you know, people taking refuge here from Newcastle. So there you are. I can't escape you guys. You can't. It's very difficult to explain to escape the English. I had many friends who fled to Greece during the period of lockdown here. Indeed. Very Indeed. easy. Right, let's go straight into it. Let's let's I'll start with a I'll start with um I mean we're, we're gonna leave what we'll always do, I think, is try and leave the audience with a bit of hope and optimism. But that will mean probably taking some pretty depressing detours. So we should be clear about that. Let's just start yeah. at the beginning of the the beginning of the twenty uh, the second half of the twenty tens. There was this moment of political possibility and hope in different parts. There was uh, there was the rise of Corbyn's Labour. Uh, there was Syriza in Greece. Uh, there was Podemos in Spain. There was Bernie Sanders uh, twenty sixteen in the United States. And we now in a situation where Corbyn's Labour Labour was battered. Series, uh, after spending it, we're all battered. We're all battered, very well battered. <laughs> Everyone got battered. Series, uh, Podemos is actually in government, but they're no, originally they were that, ahead of the That's the end of it. Well, I want to hear about that. What, what has gone so badly wrong for all these political projects? Well, firstly, I think it's important to place the, this wave of radicality in its historical context. You will recall before the crisis in 2008 where the first spate of um, um, an uprising globally, more or less, uh, with the World Social Forum, remember the Bologna demonstrations uh, happening um, in Brazil as well as in Argentina, that was the first uh, global movement against uh, uh, globalization, against effectively the unshackling of finance and financialization. Uh, it culminated in the opposition to the Iraq war, and it fizzled out. Then we had a major crash of 2008, the financial crisis. And all the movements that uh, you mentioned, from Bernie Sanders, Syriza, Podemos, um, and so on, they were a response to the newfangled regime that was imposed after 2008 by the G20, which I, I described very simply as socialism for the bankers, and the very few on the one hand, and austerity, universalized austerity for the many. Uh, the reaction to that, especially the repossessions of homes, uh, the um, serious shrinking of uh, social security provisions, the austerity in Britain under George Osborne, the repossessions uh, in the United States in particular, uh, that ended the second social contract between working class and the powers that be, which was based on financialization of homes. That gave rise to, initially, the Occupy Wall Street movement. Uh, very soon after that, the uh, Indignados in Spain and the Aganactismeni in Sintagma Square in Athens. And if you look at you know, the Bernie Sanders political revolution, the Podemos movement, the series arise from you know three percent of the vote to forty percent of the vote. All those were the um, electoral manifestations of that left-wing progressive reaction 
to socialism for the few and uh, austerity for the many. Uh, what went wrong? Well, the system, let's call it that, the liberal establishment, got its act together. Uh, it started in Greece in 2015 because we were the first uh, occasion when this movement uh, and its electoral uh, manifestation managed to win government. Uh, I spent six months uh, in that government as a, uh, as a Minister of Finance of Greece and I witnessed it. I witnessed the, uh, the manner in which the minds of the powers that be concentrated on crushing the government. I, mean, I was a finance minister that had the onerous task of negotiating with creditors who didn't want their money back. You know, just, just try to contemplate that. Creditors who didn't want their money back because they were far more interested in crushing our government, even if that meant that um, you know, they wouldn't get their money back. Uh, because for them, that was a decent investment into securing the crushing of similar rebellions electoral rebellions in places like Spain. Uh, and let me oh, oh, and just remind our viewers, listeners, friends, uh, of what happened when my prime minister at the time, Alexis Tsipras, uh, surrendered to that cabal of the establishment. After many hours of being in a room, uh, he came out and he actually signed a surrender document, a proper surrender document. In other words, his left-wing government uh, accepted the onus of imposing the worst austerity in the history of humanity upon the people that elected him to end austerity. Uh, so that's a su surrender document. And what happened the next moment was so eye-glaringly significant. The Spanish prime minister, who represented the right and a government that had imposed similar austerity willingly as part of the establishment, fearing the Spanish Syriza, which was the Podemos movement that was going up in the polls at the time, came out of that building holding that piece of paper, the surrender document signed by Alexis Tsipras, in front of the Spanish cameras, saying, this is what you get if you vote for Spain's Syriza. Well, very soon after that, you know, Podemos started going down. Podemos made a very big mistake of supporting the surrender by Syriza. So in the radicality left just disappeared, and now they are just a junior partner in in a coalition with an establishment social democratic party. Um, I remember that very summer, oh, and I remember being in Brighton at the TUC conference. It was just after Jeremy Corbyn had been elected, and I remember standing up. I had John McDonald, my great friend and comrade, and I'm sure it is yours as well. Uh, sitting next to me, and I congratulated both John and Jeremy for, you know, effectively taking over the asylum, <laughs> the Labour Party. And um, but I finished my speech saying, "Comrades, uh, beware! The system is going to try to jettison you. You are a clear and present danger for the interests of multinational companies, of the City of London, of all those who want to continue with privatizing." You know, the land, water supplies, the NHS and everything. And your worst enemy is not going to be the press, it's not going to be the Tories, it's going to come from within the party. This is where the coup d'etat is going to take place. Because Owen, you know, when I was going through this six-month fight, uh, in the end, the people who actually stabbed us in the back were our own comrades within the same, the same party who ended up, in the end, implementing on behalf of the establishment the austerity policies. And the same thing happened in the United States. Look at Bernie Sanders, who overthrew, overthrew, impeded Bernie from winning the primaries. It was the establishment within the Democratic Party who preferred Donald Trump uh, to any radical takeover of the Democratic Party. This is too long an answer, but, you know, I don't know, it just came out. <laughs> it was a very, very eloquent and well thought out answer. But isn't the danger that we end up then with a fatalistic conclusion that demobilizes people, that any left project in any context any country will is inherently doomed because the forces of the establishment will always conspire to destroy them and if that's the case why don't we just give up not in the slightest not in the slightest when you fail you try again and you try to do it better you remember tony ben's infamous and wonderful expression 
There is no final victory, comrades, and there is no final defeat. Every generation, that those were, I believe verbatim his words, every generation is condemned to fight the same struggle and ag again and again and again. And, you know, that's a wonderful thing because uh, I don't know about you. I'm sure that applies to you too. Life is wonderful when you get up in the morning and you're fighting that struggle. And, you know, by keep pushing at, at that, you know, a huge vessel, at some point we are going to start moving it. And that will be a wonderful moment, worthwhile living to see it. Um, uh, give me your political analysis of Keir Starmer's Labour. Well, um, Labour has been normalised again under Keir Starmer. Uh, the establishment is breathing a major sigh of relief because under Keir Starmer, Labour is not a threat to its hegemony, to the hegemony of the, um, the triangle of authority, which is on the one hand the City of London, secondly uh, the media, and uh, thirdly uh, a, a part of the corporate world which um, simply relies on the kindness of uh, the Bank of England and the state to survive. That establishment uh, had a scare when uh, not only did Jeremy Corbyn win the leadership of the Labour Party, but in uh, 2017 he, he got a higher proportion of the, vote, of the vote that Tony Blair ever did in his two election victories. Uh, that was a moment when the establishment thought, oh my God, there may be a government that um, you know, uh, nationalizes uh, the railways again, uh, and, and, and not in the way Boris Johnson did, but in a way which is in the interest of the many, not of the privatized companies. A, 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 a government that reverses the process of insidious undercover privatization of the NHS, a government that actually uh, takes 10% of shares of corporations and give it to the workers or to a public equity fund. Um, so Keir Starmer now is, has defunct all the radicality from the Labour Party. I read the recent document on the Green New Deal that they came up with, which was a, a rehashed version of the 2019 programme. Uh, there is nothing particularly green in it, or new, um, and it's certainly not a new deal in the sense that Keir Starmer has succeeded in making Boris Johnson's green industrial revolution, by the way, isn't it amazing that Boris even stole the term that Jeremy Corbyn introduced. Uh, they must, Keir Starmer succeeded in making Boris Johnson look more green and more radical than the Liberal Party is. I mean, on that, do you know, I mean, you're touching on like, this wider phenomenon, which is a new form of right-wing populism. Well, it's not that new anymore. But if we look at Hungary, for example, the regime of Orban, if we look at the regime in Poland, what they've done is raided aspects in rhetoric and sometimes in substance of left-wing economic ideas. In Hungary, they the regime nationalized the pension funds. In Poland, they talk of you know welfareism, of uh, of Polonization in terms of public ownership of banks. As you say, in Britain, we'll talk about what will come next after after the pandemic. But they're raiding things like the green industrial revolution. They didn't stand on a platform of austerity in 2019, unlike Theresa May and David Cameron. What is that political phenomenon? How dangerous is it and how do we fight it? We forget, Owen, what fascism was. You know, fascism in the 1920s and 30s was a movement, the purpose of which was to offer a new social contract uh, to the working class. So when Benito Mussolini stood up on his soapbox and addressed the public in Italy, uh, he said to them, that you know the time when the ruling class uh, was treating you like cattle uh, is over. Their impunity is over. Vest in me dictatorial powers. Make me the overlord. Give up on the right to unionize, on the right to, 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 you know, to, to elect your representatives, and I shall make you proud again. And that includes giving you a guaranteed wage, which is much higher than what you have now. Uh, let's not forget that Benito Mussolini was the first European leader of a government that introduced a universal pension system. It was not the Labour Party in 1945, it was Benito Mussolini. So I will look after you in a kind of patronizing, paternalistic, authoritarian way, uh, 
I will make you proud to be Italian again, or British, or American, or Greek, or whatever, right? Uh, I'm going to turn you against, you know, the Jew, the gay, uh, the lesbian, the, the riffraff, uh, the, the German, the Greek, the Muslim, it doesn't matter, the other, right? Whoever the other might be, we can invent others as well. Uh, and so this is it. I will empower you with more money and nationalist pride. Uh, and you will empower me with all political decision making um, on your behalf. Now, that's what Mussolini did. And this is what the Hungarian government is doing. It's, it's what the Polish government is doing. Uh, it's what the Greek government is doing as we speak, because I have some bad news from this neck of the woods. Uh, Greece is the third illiberal democracy, using Orbán's term. Um, for a year and a half now, we had a right-wing government that took advantage of the fact that Syriza had you know, effectively, effectively betrayed all its promises to, 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 to the people of Greece. So the right came back in. The first thing they did was to end uh, the right of students to have conferences and congregate and have meetings in universities without the police having the capacity to break in. Yeah, that's the liberal part. Um, at the same time, a major uh, backlash against refugees, against anyone who's brown on the street. Uh, the Coast Guard being given direct orders to violate international law and whenever they see a flimsy boat full of refugees uh, to push it back into the waves and effectively risk the lives of those people um, in order to create a fortress Greece. Um, last week we had a demonstration in Athens and uh, our members of parliament of Mera 25, we were uh, effectively um, placed under illegal arrest because the constitution supposedly gives members of parliament, uh, the, the right of freedom of movement. Uh, so we have this illiberal um, wave, which is founded on a not so farcical recapitulation of the fascist uh, techniques and tactics during the mid-war period. Um, by the way, I must say, Yanis has got this brilliant new book out, which is called uh, Another Now, which charts an alternative. We will come on and talk about this, but it's a must read. Do go and get yourself a copy. But in terms of the crisis we're now in, the pandemic, how much, in terms of the economic consequences, how do you judge them compared to, say, the 2008 crash, the Great Depression of the 1930s? How much of a lasting economic, the lasting economic consequences are? And what do you think the political consequences will be? I always try to convince people, friends, comrades, audiences, that the pivotal moment was 2008. That 2008 was our generation's 1929. 1929 changed the world. Uh, it uh, came at the end of a decade of irrational exuberance, uh, the roaring 20s, uh, with financialization together with mega corporations and network companies like Ford, motor companies like Edison and so on, uh, going berserk. And, you know, that period of Effectively, financialization coupled with a neoliberal logic crashed and burned in 1929. That created fascism, Nazism in Europe. It gave rise to the New Deal in uh, the United States. In the end, an alliance of the New Dealers and the Soviet Union crashed the fascists. And we had um, about two decades between 1950 and 1970 of the golden era of capitalism, because capitalism effectively was um, uh, planned. It was placed under very strict restrictions on what bankers could do and what they could get away with. Uh, uh, banking became very boring, plain Valinda. Uh, that system was overthrown in the early 1970s, and we had a second period leading to the new 1920s in the 1990s and 2000s. And that led to our generation's 1929-2008. And then what happened was quite astonishing. Uh, you had, unlike in 1929 when the Federal Reserve, the central banks, didn't know what to do and did nothing. In 2008, 2009, the central bankers of the world uh, and our political leaders, uh, led by Gordon Brown, in, in fact, in April 2009 in the summit of the G20 that took place in London, uh, they coordinated and they together 
put the printing presses of the Bank of England, the Federal Reserve, the European Central Bank, the Bank of Japan, the Bank of Sweden, and so on, all together, they were churning money as if there was no tomorrow, giving it to the financial sector. Only the United States, especially after Obama got in place, in power, um, they handed over around, my estimation is $12 trillion to the financial sector, only in the United States. Add to that the Bank of England, the Bank of Japan, the European Central Bank. Yeah, you have you know, a tsunami of cash going to the financial sector to refloat it. And refloat it, they did. While at the same time, practicing austerity everywhere. So the little people, austerity. Financiers, socialism. Socialism, you know, and the money tree. <laughs> They're accusing the socialists of having invented the money tree, but they actually created a, a, a gigantic money tree going all into the financial sector. Now, the reason why, why am I saying this in the context of your question about COVID-19 and the pandemic? Well, because COVID-19 came and joined forces with a process of stagnation that started back then in 2009. All this financial liquidity created uh, a magnificent growth of asset values, share prices in the stock exchanges, but never translated, never, never translated into serious investment in good quality jobs and the green transition, which you know, society and the planet needed. So between 2008 and 2020, we had this remarkable incongruity. The largest amount of money in the history of capitalism circulating in the financial system savings, if you want to think of it simply, and the lowest level of investment in jobs and the green transition and technologies compared to the amount of liquidity available. Now, that chasm, disconnection between the supply of money, because this is what you know I'm talking about here, and the demand for money for investment purposes, you know, when supply is much greater than demand, the price of the thing keeps falling. The price of the thing is the interest rate. That's why we have negative interest rates. Now, this may sound a bit technical, but it's not really. What this shows is that we have a situation where capitalism has more or less transcended itself. Profits, very low. Dividends, very low. Investment, very low. The wealth of the capitalist, gigantic. So you have this, this, this strange phenomenon. That was before COVID-19 came. So people out there, uh, mid, the, the middle class, in the United States, in Britain, in the European Union, they could see their, their children were going to have a much worse life than they did. So that created discontent, anger, that fueled nationalism, it fueled, uh, you know, Brexit, uh, Trump, uh, you know, Orban, and so on. At the same time, you had corporations that didn't really need to make a profit in order to survive, in order to do well, because they could take money from the central bank, go to the stock exchange, buy their shares, the share price would go up, their bonuses depended on the share price. They were, they were laughing all the way to the bank, literally. Uh, and then COVID-19 comes. It attacks both demand and supply because factories and companies and restaurants had to close, so supply was restricted. Demand, because people we were locked in like we are locked in, so uh, demand went down on average. Uh, and what did governments do? The same old. They printed more money, gave it to the same financiers, the financiers gave it to the same corporations, the corporations bought back more shares, but didn't invest. So my view of COVID-19 is that it is a turbocharger. The existing crisis of capitalism from 2008, this secular stagnation that started in 2008, has been turbocharged by COVID-19. Uh, and, and, you know, so, okay, so that's the bad news. The good news is that you know, people can now look, see that government has a lot of power. They can tell you you're not going to step out of your home. I mean, I'm not against the lockdown because we need to contain the pandemic. But, you know, up until 2008 or 2020, to be more precise, uh, most of us, even speaking personally, we thought, OK, now, what power does the prime minister have? What power do the ministers have? It's, all power is, is invested in the city of London, in the Royal Bank of Scotland, Goldman Sachs, and so on. But now people can see, including ourselves, how much power the state has. So, you know, maybe our, a combination of our analysis of this socialism for the few and austerity for the many, with a realization also of the immense power that the state has acquired during 
COVID-19, um, is going to make us a bit more ambitious about what we can do with power in order to empower the powerless. Um, in terms of the European Union, I mean, a question Professor Stephen Keane wanted me to, to pose to you. You may know him, he's an economist uh, who, who, who predicted the, the economic crash back in 2008. But he, he asked, do you, do you see any prospect for the overthrow of the EU fiscal rules because of COVID? And what are the prospects for European level Treasury after it? And more broadly, I suppose, how could, what is the impact of this crisis going to be on the, the EU and the Eurozone in particular? Well, hi, Steve. Steve is a friend from a very long time ago. Um, look, it all depends on Germany. <laughs> so for the benefit of our viewers who are not uh, au fait regarding the economics of the European Union, um, we are all in a kind of straitjacket imposed by the rich countries, by the surplus countries. So Italy cannot spend more than a certain amount. Greece, the same thing. Austerity is uh, institutionalized. Um, as part of something called the fiscal compact. Effectively, when you hear the words fiscal compact or fiscal rules in the EU, this is you know, the institutionalization of austerity for the many in the European Union. Now, they had to suspend that. And they had to suspend that, of course, because you know we are now in a precipitous fall. So it's impossible to ask the Italian state at the moment, or the Greek state, or the Spanish state, or indeed the German state, to balance their books when the private sector is in free fall. Uh, so, because the German uh, regime, establishment, government, call it whatever you want, uh, had to relax the fiscal rules for themselves, they had to relax them for Italy, Spain, Greece, and so on. So the you know, 10 trillion euro question is, when will Berlin manage to balance its books? The moment Berlin manages to balance its books, the email will come out from Berlin to Brussels and say, OK, we're back in fiscal compact territory. And then an email or a telephone call will go from Brussels to Rome, to Madrid, to Paris, to Athens, saying we're back in austerity mode. And that is going to be such a tremendous shock to Europeans, because as we are getting out of the pandemic and some businesses start breathing again, austerity is going to hit us. And it will be disproportionate because the fiscal deficits will be much greater in a place like Greece or Italy that have been hit much harder due to the flimsiness of our public health systems, of our economy, of our industry. Uh, we are going to have a lot more balancing of the books to do than, than the German government does, which means a lot more austerity in the countries that have been hit more by the recession. So the centrifugal forces tearing Europe apart are going to be multiplied and um, reinforced by you know what's coming. Unfortunately, in in the United States, Donald Trump's obviously he's he's gone. I think we can safely say Joe Biden is now going to assume the presidency. We don't know where things will stand in terms of the Senate. Probably though, the Republicans will maintain control. But nonetheless, what's your analysis of where? Biden's administration, what political course is it likely to pursue? And now there is a US left, the so-called squad of progressive uh, members of the House of Representatives has now expanded in the recent elections. How much power, how much uh, leverage do you think they will have and what their, their, their role will be in the coming period? Very little, I'm afraid. And the reason for that is that Biden won. Thankfully, Trump is out. But uh, he won with, um, without controlling the Senate and, we, and by losing seats in the House of Reps. So, remember, Biden did not want a Green New Deal. Biden does not want Medicare for all. Biden does not want uh, to confront um, you know, China or other countries regarding climate change. He has all the, the right rhetoric about it, uh, but he's in the pocket of the you know, big business in the United States, Wall Street, ExxonMobil, all those companies. Uh, and now he has a fantastic excuse of reneging on the agreement he had with Bernie Sanders and the squad. He had an agreement with them, unlike in 2016 when Hillary Clinton uh, thought um, that she could win without the left that was disproved. 
uh, Biden realized that he needed the left. So he made an agreement with the left. The agreement was the Green New Deal uh, uh, in particular. Uh, but now that he doesn't control the Senate and has even less of a majority, a smaller majority in the House of Representatives, uh, I know for a fact that he has already turned around to the squad, to the left, and said, uh, folks now have to do business with the Republicans. Uh, and he's reneging on these agreements. So our comrades in the United States need all our support to keep fighting the good fight. I very much fear that um, the fact that, you know, effectively the United States government is an automatic pilot. This constitution of theirs, which ensures that, uh, more ensures, more or less ensures that uh, um, no one is actually in control of government. You have the White House moving in one direction, you have the Senate moving in another direction. Effectively, it will be business as usual. This business as usual is going to mean a long recession um, in the next year or two. And who is going to get, take the blame for that? The Republicans are uniting beyond belief under Trumpism, not Trump, but Trumpism. They have this false sense, but a very strong sense that they were being robbed, that they were robbed during the election. Uh, the Democrats are split between the uh, establishment um, representatives, the representatives of Silicon Valley, of big business, of uh, big of um, Wall Street, that's Biden, and the left. And I very much fear that uh, everybody's going to turn against the left and blame the a long slump that we are facing ahead of us on the left. Uh, this is something that the Republicans and Biden are going to agree on, I fear. The climate emergency, I mean, we mentioned the Green New Deal. Can Is capitalism capable of overcoming the existential threat to human civilization posed by the climate emergency? The short answer is no. Uh, but capitalism is not a monolithic thing. Yeah, remember that in 1933, uh, Franklin Roosevelt, who was not a socialist, he was a patrician, he was um, you know, very conservative, really, but he understood that capitalism was its own worst enemy. And in that in 1929 and between 1929 and 1932, it was uh, effectively undermining itself. It was um, creating a crisis that it couldn't overcome uh, through market forces. So he stepped in with a new deal and um, seriously curtailed uh, the capacity of bankers to make decisions, effectively nationalize them. Um, for 20 years after that, in, after the Second World War, the new dealers ensured that the bankers were diminished figures. They could do very little. Um, uh, they, they had very heavy constraints placed upon, upon them. So it is possible as a stepping stone towards um, um, policies that, and institutions that are true to the needs of the planet and of humanity. It is possible to constrain the more uh, deleterious and malignant forces of capitalism in the context of a New Deal to make a very quick difference when it comes to uh, emissions to climate change uh, practices uh, and policies. Uh, but in the end, we cannot civilize this beast. This is why, you know, I wrote the book that you very kindly plugged, uh, because I think we start, you know, we, we socialists, we have to start re-envisioning what socialism must mean in an era where capitalism is already, as I was saying earlier, um, transforming itself into a post-capitalism, a dystopic post-capitalism. Oh, and, you know, this is, we don't live under capitalism anymore. It's something far worse than capitalism. I call it techno-feudalism. If you come to consider the fact that 90% of companies listed in the New York Stock Exchange belong to three companies, Vanguard, BlackRock, and State Street, that's not competitive capitalism anymore. This is a pure oligarchy with occasional elections that are bought by the oligarchs. Um, and, uh, you know, a central bank, a state, uh, effectively keeping those oligarchs alive. That's feudalism. It's a techno-feudalism because now it's high-tech. We have apps and we have Facebook and we have Google and we have Amazon and all that. Uh, but nevertheless, it is a dystopic post-capitalism. So we socialists have a duty to envisage a utopic post-capitalism. 
before we end on the, the optimistic vision of, of the book, which I will keep plugging, a, a lot of people obviously are bringing up fascism, and which you've already mentioned, and the threat posed by fascism in this period of crisis. What's the left strategy in terms of an anti-fascist strategy? And more broadly, because it's not just fascism, in this country we've seen the metamorphosis like the Republicans into a more authoritarian breed of right-wing populism. You know, what are the prospects, do you think, of, of the likes of Boris Johnson or Orban being toppled in this crisis in favour of something different? I think the strategy of progressives must be to engage with the people who are susceptible to the fascist narrative, to do exactly the opposite of what uh, Hillary Clinton did, which is to refer to them as deplorables, and therefore to deliver them straight into the hands of the fascists like Donald Trump. It is, it is to do the, the, the opposite of what the hard remainers did in Britain, which is to treat those who voted for Brexit as if they were vermin in a zoo, and to engage with people, you know, to understand that um, the, you know, people in, in the north of England, in the coastal areas, in the Midwest in the United States, here in Greece, uh, even when they vote, for an ultra-right-wing xenophobe, it's an act of desperation uh, to, to have sympathy with them, to have empathy with them, to discuss with them, to explain to them why they are, in a sense, empowering somebody who is going to turn against them, who is going to give them a few crumbs off their table in exchange for perfect and perpetual servitude. Uh, I personally refuse to abandon those people to the sirens of the fascists. It's essential that to go out there and humbly debate with them, explain to them, learn from them, and um, you know, do what they do. What the, you know, the right are very good at community organizing, at speaking to people as equals. The left has failed spectacularly to do that. We must do it, and we must do it at an international level, at a global level. In terms of, in the book, what, what you've tried to do is answer the perennial objection to people like us, which is you know what you're against, but you're less clear on what you're for. And one of the things you explore, for example, is cooperative, uh, kind of cooperative models of in terms of companies. So one, in terms of just flesh that out a bit in terms of the economic alternative more broadly, and what someone, Costas, uh, has submitted a question asking how such a novel economy deals with or prevents economic crises. Well, I try to answer this in the book, uh, and because I try to be as self-critical as I can in the other now, which is a market socialist world, uh, I even conjure up the crash of 2022. I imagine that the, the socialist society has an economic crisis, and I try to imagine what kind of economic crisis would, would it be like, and also uh, how does that system uh, manage to respond to it and, and heal itself from it. Because, you know, all societies have crises. I'm sure socialism is going to suffer economic crisis as well. Uh, but to, 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 to give a whiff of the essence of the kind of economy that I envisage, of a democratic, liberal, market, socialist economy, if you can put all these things in one. Uh, two points. Number one, who owns the corporation? I envisage a world in which you get hired to work in a company, small, medium, large, doesn't matter. And the moment you enter, just as when you enroll at university, you get a library card, which you cannot trade, you could not rent, but you can use, you get one share in the corporation. And nobody can get a share unless they are employees. And that share allows you to vote for everything in the company. You don't have to vote, but you can vote. And um, once you leave that company, you go to another one, you give it back, and you take another library card, another. So oh. it's a principle of one person, one share, one vote. Uh, that doesn't mean that everybody gets paid the same. What it means is there has to be consent, democratic consent, amongst members of the company um, for uh, pay inequalities. We can all decide that, you know, um, Kate needs to pay a lot more money because she's adding a lot more value to our collective. To our corporation, uh, and if we don't pay her a lot more money, we will lose her. But we all decide, even the janitor and the secretary consents to Kate getting, you know, twice, three times the salary that we get, the rest of us. So that's what, the moment you do that, you end, you have no share markets because shares are not tradable, like votes are not tradable or shouldn't be tradable, right? Um, and secondly, imagine if the central bank, the Bank of England in your case, uh, opens a bank account for each 
resident, a free digital bank account. Suddenly, there is no need to have commercial bank accounts. If, in other words, you take out of the market system share markets and commercial banks, you end up with a market society that is post-capitalist and where power is not concentrated in such few hands with, you know, the greatest problem of this power being that it creates inefficiency and a tendency for the system not to be able to generate enough demand in order for people to be able to buy the things that society can produce. So, finally, you've, you've presented a very, you know, an, a coherent, optimistic alternative. But we look back and, and, and make sure we're, we're going to try and we're going to try and end on a wave of optimism here. But we look yeah. back to 2008 and back then there was a sense of hubris on the scattered remnants of the time of the left, which was part of the problem that the that neoliberalism had self evidently been discredited by the financial crash and that from the rubble of of that crash, the left would naturally return with its narrative uh, once again revitalized. And of course, the problem with it was, I mean, as Milton Friedman, who I like to quote, once put it, you know, when th the way you get change is is through a crisis and then the politically impossible can become the politically inevitable. But he warned it depends on the ideas lying around. And obviously in 2008, because the left had been so defeated, so much in retreat for so long, ideologically, institutionally, as a movement, social forces in society, that it didn't have a mass base and a coherent alternative. And the right wing, the neoliberals did. They had their think tanks, well-funded. They had their institutions. They had the economists who dominated the academy with the Keynesians purged over the generation before. What do you think the prospects are for this time? For avoiding what, you know, again, once again, you know, Boris Johnson said there won't be a return to austerity. This government are already talking about a de facto pay cut for the, the key workers who are applauded out of windows by government ministers who'd spent a decade attacking their terms, conditions, pensions and jobs. But what do you think the, the potential is for the left having a coherent alternative that can resonate with people to avoid with? yet another round of austerity after 10 years of austerity that has ripped the social fabric apart of entire nations, not least Greece, but other places as well. What are the prospects? How do we go about it? And, and what are the dangers if it's austerity uh, and, and that once again, that is victorious, to, that the majority pick up the bill for this crisis all over again? I think we have the opportunity. I think the prospects are excellent. And I'm not just saying that to end on an optimistic note. I truly believe it. Um, what, what we didn't have in 2008, and we didn't have it in 2020 either, but maybe we're getting better at it. What we didn't have, we didn't have a transnational movement with you know, a, a common organizational structure and a common plan for what we want. You know, an international Green New Deal and a, a vision for, you know, a progressive kind of democratic socialism. That kind of internationalist organization is what the fascist had uh, and the bankers. The, it's called Davos, right? Uh, that's, what, that's what Davos is. It's the Internationale of the bankers. They have it. They have the organization and they have the blueprint. We need that. We didn't have it in 2008 uh, and we didn't have it in 2020. But the reason why I'm saying the prospects are excellent is because a couple of years ago, uh, Bernie Sanders and I inaugurated something we call the Progressive International, which is this idea. And now, as we speak, we are fleshing it out together with, you know, comrades like Noam Chomsky, like Arundhati Roy from India, um, uh, Lula from Brazil, um, Jeremy and John are part of it, so are members of the Green Party and so on. Uh, and we're doing this in Nigeria, in Kenya and so on. So it... it the, the reason why I'm optimistic is because once we put out that call, now we have 80 million members or organizations whose membership exceeds 80 million. This Black Friday, this Friday, we start our first campaign in this context. Uh, we are not announcing it fully until the Thursday. We are going to, you know, we are going to ambush public opinion. Uh, and we are going to ask people around the world simply to... Uh, desist from visiting Amazon.com for one day, while at the same time the International Trade Union Congress and many other trade unions organizations are going to be staging uh, strikes in warehouses of Amazon 
uh, under the hashtag make Amazon pay. This is a kind of global, international campaign of solidarity, including workers and consumers, citizens, in the context of a vision of how we can operate internationally and act in local solidarity to particular suffering workers, small businesses that are being closed down by Amazon. This is just one beginning. But the objective should be to have a Green New Deal for the world that we work transnationally to towards. I think that is what we have been missing in 2008 and the reason for our defeat or sequence of defeat since then. Yeah, it's been an absolute pleasure. I could not recommend this more in terms of if you're looking uh, for, for for a sense of optimism, a sense of, of political possibility, then this book is very important because these are difficult and trying times, uh, not just to, to be a leftist, but to, to, to be a human being in a time of tumult and, and crisis, which is profoundly unsettling, disturbing. Uh, but Yanis, you've given, given, I think, people who watched a something to be optimistic about. So thank you. Well, thank you, Owen. You're doing it too. <laughs> Do my best. Well, I certainly needed that. And, and I hope you got a lot from that as well. Uh, very eloquent, very persuasive. A lot of realism thrown in with the optimism. These are difficult times and we need to have a hard head look at where we're at if we're going to work out where where we're going to go from here. I'd love to hear your thoughts, so please, please do leave them as ever. I'm sure you will, whether or not I ask you to or not. And if you want to support us as we expand and give a platform to a very broad range of people and do videos which give a platform to the marginalised, which we're going to be doing video after video on, marginalised people, marginalised causes, as well as standing up to the powerful, then please support us if you can on Patreon. Uh, Patreon slash Owen Joe's 84 and please subscribe to the channel. We need your support and go to the main, my main YouTube page, press the bell so you get notifications when the next videos are coming up. We've got some amazing videos coming up. They're going to be powerful. They're going to be incisive, I would say, uh, partly because of the work of others rather than myself. So please tune in and I'll see you next time.